Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the ninth meeting of our seminar on the lifetimes and work of Ludwig von Mises. Uh, we are on the last day of our seminar. It's now time to talk about Mises in America. Uh, so this is only 20% of our, our seminar, but it's also only 20% of the book. Uh, it might have been justified to talk more about Mises on, on America, but there were other good st uh, studies uh, already available on, on Mises' time in America, much more personal testimonies and so on. There, there's a very good book by, a very good doctoral dissertation uh, by um, uh, Julian or Julian Del Gaudio, published in 1986 by uh, the University of Michigan, uh, which deals with uh, Ludwig von Mises' impact on uh, the intellectual life in the United States and with his life in, uh, in America, 1940 to uh, 1986. Well, Mises did not live until 1986, but he examined the impact on, up until 1986. So it was not necessary for me to uh, repeat all the things that could be found in this book, but to emphasize a bit, uh, a certain elements that were neglected there. And in any case, to cut back short in compared to the analysis of his lifetime and work before the American years. So therefore, a relatively minor uh, uh, quantitative uh, presence of Mises' American years. So we'll have two lectures today on, uh, on that period of his life, the last third of his life. Well, first, uh, this, uh, this morning, uh, talk a little bit about how he started the new life, how he came to be integrated in, um, uh, in the American context. And then this afternoon, we will talk more particularly about the impact that he had through the publication of Human Action, because Human Action gave birth to a Misesian movement. Mises arrived in New York City on August 3, 1940. I told you yesterday that he left Lisbon, therefore Europe, with a ship by the name of Europe, uh, July 20th, 25th, and so on. About a week later, he arrives in New York City, and it is in this city uh, that he would stay for the rest of his life. Of course, he would leave it for vacations and visits and, and talks and so on, but he became eventually a New Yorker. Uh, in New York, uh, he found uh, uh, many friends, so he did not have to start uh, in the in a, uh, emotional cultural desert, Many uh, friends and, and uh, associates from Vienna times and also from Geneva were, were already there. And in fact, uh, almost all seminar members, almost all members of his private seminar were at that point in New York City. So he could have resumed the, the sessions of the seminar. But he did not because there were more urgent things to do. Uh, even the family doctor was there. Okay, so there was a context. Of, and of the, the difference was, of course, that... Um, in, in Vienna, it, where everything was much smaller and much more concentrated, well, it was easier to get together. In New York, a great metropolitan area, uh, people were a little bit more dispersed. So Mises did not mount as uh, an American edition of his private seminar, but he had to deal first with a more urgent problem, which was money. So he arrives uh, there, and of course he has some, some savings from... Uh, his uh, Geneva years, he had, he had a good salary in Geneva, uh, but now there's no money at all, no income at all, and uh, he has been cut off of uh, other assets that he had held in Austria and in Britain. Uh, in Austria, of course, there was his pension funds, he was in early uh, retirement, and he had a very decent uh, uh, pension, but with the Nazi takeover of uh, Austria in 1938, they cut off all payments. Uh, so... Uh, they, uh, they uh, 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 did not honor the contractual obligations that Mises had with the Austrian government. Very nasty thing. But what do you expect of such bandits? Uh, in Britain, he had some money too, uh, due to uh, his book publications. He had published uh, The Theory of Money and Credit and then Socialism by British publishers um, in the 1930s. And he had a, a fairly decent bank account. But then, of course, what happened with the, with the start of the war, there was immediate foreign exchange control. So you could not export the money anymore. 
So what do you do? Yeah, you could use it uh, only within uh, Britain. So Mises gave uh, an authorization to Hayek, who was a professor at the London School of Economics. And then Hayek, um, uh, well, he could not ship the money to the U.S., but he did something else. He bought a highly marketable uh, good that didn't weigh too much and had a high uh, value, high monetary uh, value per uh, weight unit, and shipped it over to the U.S. Now, the question for you is, what might this have been? Something that intellectuals are very close to emotionally. Books, exactly. Right? So he bought, Hayek bought rare books. Right? Among other things, the first edition of uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, two complete sets of uh, uh, Jeremy Bentham's collected works, and similar things. Okay, And he shipped those over to the U.S. because, well, the American uh, and British uh, uh, authorities had not yet come to the idea that value could be smuggled out of the country in this way. But you see also that Mises must have had quite a, a sum on, on his bank account because even in those days already a first edition of, of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation was not uh, uh, to be had for, for nothing. So, but still, right, so this was some money, and but it was still not an income. He had to find uh, new sources of income, and that was certainly not easy, as we can imagine, a man of 59 years. Right? Today, if I look around in France, uh, some people get, get fired. Uh, they're 35 or so, or 25, and they say, oh, what am I going to do now? My life is ruined, and so on. And uh, it's even more difficult in the case of intellectuals, of course. Right? Intellectuals have... Uh, uh, from from the, the point of view of capital theory, are highly specific uh, uh, assets and highly specific factor of production. Uh, it's not easy to reconvert them into something else. But Mises uh, to, uh, tried various things, and he especially was interested in finding uh, academic employment. So uh, he uh, he gave various talks and presentations to schools, in particular in, in New York City. Uh, and attended meetings of uh, professional associations, such as, for example, the American Economic Association meeting in uh, uh, December 1940 in New Orleans. Uh, that, so we can infer uh, therefrom that he was uh, quite in desperate need of money because he didn't attend many other meetings of this sort later on. Uh, things eased up on the academic job market after December 1941, when the U.S. entered World War II. Uh, then the U.S. government became the largest employer of economists. So people like Machlub, Morgan Stern, uh, Friedman, of course, John Cal Kenneth Galbraith, and uh, in fact, uh, th uh, thousands of others, other economists were employed by the U.S. government. Uh, but Mises could not really profit from this uh, for reasons that are, are rather patent. Okay, so first of all, he was he was old. Uh, second, uh, you know, he had already difficulties given his views being employed in his native Austria in World War One. So uh, it's easy to understand that he would have been even more difficult for him to find employment in in a foreign country uh, in wartime uh, at a much later stage. Um, so the U.S. government was not the suitable employer for him. He had to, to find something else. Um, there was one little outlet that he found through his new friendship with Henry Hazlitt, um, an American journalist, of course, later on became a famous Austrian, fa famous proponent of uh, Misesian economics. In those days, Henry Hazlitt worked as a journalist, editorialist for the New York Times, and he had uh, known Mises not personally, but only through his writings. And Hazlitt had written in particular a highly sympathetic book review of the English edition of Socialism. So Mises was aware of the existence of Hazlitt. Um, and, um, uh, and one day called him. That, that was quite a, uh, a funny incident. Ah, yeah, here. So I will read this for you. Um, how Hazlitt recalled how, how they, they met in New York. So, Hazlitt, sometime in 1940, I got a telephone call. The voice on the other end said, 
This is Mises speaking. Of course, he said it's somewhat different. This is Mises speaking or whatever. As I've told many of my friends since, it was as, as if someone had called and said, this is John Stuart Mill speaking. <laughs> I had referred to Mises as a classic. And you don't expect a classic to call you on the telephone. <laughs> anyway, that led to our acquaintance. And uh, so, so Haslick, of, of course, perceived the need. And uh, he got Mises to write uh, editorials for the New York Times. That was not much. So Mises wrote maybe eight or so editorials starting in uh, March 1941, each of which was paid $10. Okay, now you've always got to think, right, $10 to get a rough idea at $35 per ounce of gold. Okay, so would have been, whatever, $200 today, which is not bad for a verbal editorial, but it's certainly not something that would keep you going uh, for a long while. So what uh, uh, really saved uh, Mises eventually was, again, his connection to the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation funded a position for Mises at the National Bureau of Economic Research. So starting December 1940, Mises was hired by the NBER, but uh, the entire funds came from, from the Rock Rockefeller Foundation, $2,500 a year. Now, to give you a rough uh, idea of what this meant, well, college professors in those uh, years in the U.S. were paid uh, in, the, in the average around uh, $2,000. Okay, so Mises was a, a highly paid um, college professor. At the universities, for full professors, uh, salaries were much higher. I mentioned already the uh, Mark Loeb's starting salary at the University of Buffalo in 1935 was $6,500. Okay, so it's it's very different. So, but in any case, so this this kept him going for for a while, and he uh, continued at first uh, his, the projects, the research, writing and research projects that he had already started in Geneva, when he was finished with uh, National Economy, um, and he continued writing in German. Okay, so he definitely had at that point he had in mind to return to Europe at some point. And there are two projects that we might mention in particular. One is um, uh, Omnipotent Government, yeah, the book that was eventually published in 1944, which he had written in German first. So at NBR, they, they found him a, a translator, and the, the, the manuscript was translated, and he worked the, the manuscript over. This happened in, the, from, in, in, in those years. And he also worked on... Um, uh, uh, a proposal for the, uh, for the um, reorganization, political reorganization of Eastern Europe in those days. Um, when he made plans to return to Vienna in 1937, he had written a similar paper uh, in which he explained well how uh, and why Austria should seek a political union with other uh, states in the Danube uh, basin. And this in order to preserve political independence. So Mises uh, saw that, well, uh, Austria, but also the other little countries in the Danube uh, area, there's uh, uh, Yugoslavia and Hungary, uh, Romania, um, were uh, just in the middle between three mi uh, mighty neighbors, Russia, Germany, and Italy, each of whom pursued an expansionist and aggressive foreign policy. So it was just a matter of time until they would be conquered and annexed by any of these uh, uh, powers, just like Poland had been uh, conquered and then partitioned among uh, Prussia, Russia, uh, and Austria in the late 1700s. So Mises proposed uh, a political union in uh, the Danube area in 1937. And now when he uh, was working at the NVR, he worked on a proposal for the establishment of an Eastern Democratic Union, which uh, implied the political unification of virtually all of Eastern Europe, not just the Danube uh, basin, but also uh, Czechoslovakia and, and Poland in particular. So all of Eastern Europe, too. The idea was to uh, gain a sufficient mass 
a sufficiently large uh, political entity that could withstand uh, aggression from Germany, Russia, and Italy would have enough resources to defend itself. Um, these um, uh, proposals have recently been published um, by, by Liberty Fund and, uh, in volumes edited by Richard Ebeling, who has collected these, uh, these documents. Now, this is not at all something that we find in, in Moscow, right? So this has uh, been available all the time, could have been published 30 years ago or 20 years ago for anybody uh, who cared. Uh, the, the, these manuscripts have been in, in the archive of Grove City College, the archive where Mises' entire post-war correspondence is still stored. And so after Mises' death in 1973, his wife was again in need of money, right? a very similar situation as in 1970. So she sold his library, and the library was acquired by uh, Hill State College. Very beautiful room, so if you ever have the opportunity to travel to, to Michigan, go visit Hill State College, go see uh, the Mises Library. They have set, set up a, a separate room, and uh, so it's wonderful uh, uh, bookshelves with uh, books in uh, different languages. English is a minority language there. Uh, and uh, the, she sold his uh, correspondence and his files, maybe except for the love letters that she sent him, but, but some love letters are there too, uh, to Grove City College. So in Grove City College is another major source for biographical work of uh, Ludwig von Mises. And there we also find these, these manuscripts. Unfortunately, now they've been become available in beautiful editions by Liberty Fund. So it was a... Difficult start for von Mises, and he, well, he uh, must have been very frustrated, and but they survived. And then things started to improve slowly in the second half of 1941, so about a year later. The first year must have been very hard. Uh, in the summer of 1941, he had a first vacation in the U.S. He spent a vacation in the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Uh, which reminded him of the scenery of the Alps. Uh, now, this is something that we did not yet talk about before. Mises was a, well, I, I think I hinted at it, but Mises was a, a great hiking fan, great mountain hiking fan. He spent all of his summer vacations in Austria, in the Austrian Alps, in particular in the town of Bad Garstein. It's a, a resort town in, uh, in the western Alps of Austria. Beautiful setting, and so he always uh, refreshed in mountains air, when he could climb and had great views and so on. That's, that is exactly what he also found in the White Mountains. Uh, Margaret von Mises was very happy to see her husband uh, climb a different peak every day. So he gained uh, strength and, uh, and courage. Uh, they also found in, in that period uh, the permanent home. Uh, they moved to an apartment on 777 uh, West End Avenue, so you have to go visit New York City, just stroll there. Uh, it's not very far away from Columbia University. It's not very far away once you are uh, in, in the Central Park, the southern edge of the Central Park. Uh, so it's a 10-story building or so. Mises was, I believe, in the, uh, in the, in the top store story. Uh, and that's so where they moved in uh, October 1941 and stayed uh, until his death, and beyond his death, Margaret stayed there uh, until she died in 1993. Uh, well, the, the, the economic uh, uh, explanation is that there were rent controls, rent control laws, right? So they, they continued to pay a rent very similar to the one that they paid in 1940 throughout this time. Right? So it's a splendid uh, location. And in, in the second half of 1941, he started writing in English. So he must have, during the uh, vacation in the White Mountains, made new resolves and come to, to the decision that he would start a new life, really, in America and not return to Europe. To Hayek, he wrote in those days, quote, as I do not want to increase further the collection of my posthumous works, I am writing now in English. 
I hope that I will succeed to finish within a year a volume dealing critically with the whole complex of anti-Orthodox doctrines and their consequences. He went on, uh, praising Hayek's uh, uh, essays on the counter-revolution of science, that were later on uh, published uh, in, in a book with this title, The Counter-Revolution of Science. And he said, I am, however, rather skeptical in regard of the practical results of our endeavors. It seems that the age of reason and common sense is gone forever. Reasoning and thinking have been replaced by empty slogans. Does this remind you of something? A few days ago, Mises said, Alvin Hansen was a big time Keynesian at the time. Alvin Hansen delivered a lecture on post-war economic reconstruction. The old stories about full employment, scarcity of foreign exchange, the need for foreign exchange control and planning, more self-sufficiency, etc. He did not even mention the problem of capital shortage. He seems to believe that taxing the rich would make it possible to maintain the pre-war standard of living of the masses. Two centuries of economic theory were in vain, as they could not kill the mercantilist prejudices. The audience, many ex-members of the Verein für Sozialpolitik, German Association of Economic Policy, expressed full agreement with the lecturer. End of quote. So, but still, right, he, so he went on, was not very encouraging. We will talk a little bit later about this, but he, he, he went on. Uh, things uh, also improved, at least from his perspective, when in December 1941 the U.S. joined the war. Uh, as, as, as an, um, and uh, there, so there was therefore the prospect to get rid of the most aggressive national uh, socialistic uh, government, namely the, the Nazi government in Germany and, the, and its allies. Now, Mises must have uh, taken the resolve to well, start a new life in America, but there was one uh, uh, attractive alternative, could at least have potentially given uh, uh, another uh, outlet for him, and this would have been a career in Mexico. In 1941, he renewed his acquaintance with a, a Mexican businessman by the name of Montes de Oca, Senor Montes de Oca. Uh, they had met uh, the pre-war times in Europe at meetings of the International Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Montes de Oca had been a, a great admirer of his. And uh, he proposed, and so he was very happy to meet Mises in New York, see him over in the Americas. And uh, so they, they uh, he proposed Mises two projects. First one was to arrange for an, a Spanish translation of socialism. And uh, the second one was uh, to come as a visiting professor to New York, uh, to Mexico City in 1942. So both projects realized. Uh, maybe uh, in this context, a little word uh, on uh, translations. So Mises uh, was uh, uh, outright horrified at most translations of his work. And we already mentioned the, the problem of the somewhat inadequate, inadequate translation of the title of his money book. Uh, but uh, he said in, in correspondence re relating to this uh, Spanish translation of socialism, he said, well, I mean, most of these translations are, uh, are bad. There are many distortions and uh, uh, many uh, counter senses in, in, uh, in these translations. And he praised only one translation as really good, which was the French translation of his book Socialism. Okay, so this was, was a good work, and therefore he also proposed... Um, that the Spanish uh, translation be done from this French edition, because Montes de Oca could not read German, but he could read French. Okay, so it was done from the French edition. So, for you, as Mises students, uh, this means, well, always be careful. Always be careful when you uh, read uh, translations from his uh, uh, German works of the time, uh, but you can trust the, the French edition of socialism. <laughs> So Mises went to Mexico uh, for six weeks in late January to, uh, to March 1942. And even before he arrived there, Montes de Oca wrote him and said, well, we actually would like to hire you. We'd like to, uh, you to do exactly what you did in, in Vienna, be a leading uh, chief economist of the Chamber of Commerce. And in fact, there were several chambers of commerce in Mexico City, so he was proposed to be the chief of uh, economist of two chambers of commerce. 
and uh, and then teach also at the university, whichever university you wish. <laughs> Pick a university and you, you'll teach there. Uh, Misa said, okay, well, this sounds very interesting. I would like to first become acquainted with the conditions on the spot. And so didn't uh, commit to anything, went to Mexico City and then talked to people of an ex excellent stay and uh, were received uh, with great generosity and attention and stayed in the local Ritz. Okay, so it was good, of t good old times again. And uh, so Mises gave a seminar uh, in, in English and also a couple of lectures in, in French, uh, the School of Economics and was a school of, of law, both he taught at both places. And he talked to the representatives of the Chambers of Commerce uh, and um, uh, did still not commit to anything. He said, well, okay, I've got to, to think this over. Uh, and they agreed that he should start off by writing uh, a study on uh, economic condition, present economic problems in, in Mexico. What, what should be the economic strategy for, for Mexico? And that's what he did in the, in the coming months. Uh, so eventually, uh, when he, his, his host, uh, Montes de Oca, sensed that, well, Mises was not too enticed, uh, not, well, he was interested, but not really enthusiastic about this. He, he propped up his, his offer and said, well, we could also do something else. We could uh, establish an institute of the social sciences, purely economic uh, outfit, and uh, could bring on, uh, in uh, people that you like. Now, this was much more to the, uh, to the liking of Mises, and uh, in the early 1940s, there would have been, in fact, uh, a real possibility of setting up something like this because many European intellectuals were available. Many European intellectuals had to come to the U.S. and did not have uh, 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 found a su suitable employment. Later on, they, they would. Right At the end of the war, most of them were uh, accommodated very well, uh, such as Mises. But in 1940, 1941, 42, 43, things looked different. It would have been possible to uh, set up such an institution in Mexico City with a first uh, world-class uh, faculty. So people like um, uh, Rueff, uh, Mises, uh, uh, Arnold Plant, um, uh, Röpke, and so on, they, they, were, they were available. But eventually it did not come to this. Mises did not go to Mexico City, the Institute of the Social Sciences did not uh, see the day and so on. But again, right, so these were from his point of view at the time. So he, uh, he was, he was torn a little bit. So let's look, uh, back to, uh, to New York and, uh, and his activities, uh, in the Big Apple and his professional integration there. Um, one, uh, b before we come to, to um, the steps that brought him into, uh, fully paved the way to his integration into American life, there was one last activity that also, well, kept him or drew him back to, uh, to Europe, although he had already made the resolve to, to stay in the U.S., namely uh, his cooperation with Austrian expatriate groups. So many, or many expatriates uh, uh, there, where well, they, they had to flee uh, uh, the Nazi uh, government, and they were making plans for uh, the eventual reconstruction, political economic reconstruction of Austria after World War II, uh, always thinking that, well, uh, the Germans would be, uh, would lose, uh, would lose the war, uh, which eventually also, also happened. Um, now these expatriate groups, um, 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 among these uh, ex expatriate groups, there was uh, one group led by uh, monarchists and which set up an Austrian national committee in which uh, Mises cooperated. Now, Mises did not cooperate because he was a monarchist, but because uh, this was the only patriotic group, that is, uh, the only group uh, of expatriates that uh, prepared the, the restoration of an independent Austrian republic after World War II. And uh, the fact is that, well, uh, only only uh, right-wingers were doing this at the time. The Social Democrats still strove in those days for um, the integration of Austria or the continued integration of Austria within Germany. Of course, they didn't like Hitler, but they at least wanted to keep uh, the possibility open that after the war, uh, there would still be a greater Germany, including Austria, 
this time led by, by social democrats. So the only group that strove for an independent Austria, which is, was also uh, what Mises was aiming at, uh, was led by, by monarchists. Now, the monarchist movement was, uh, was very strong in Austria before the war. This had not been apparent uh, throughout, uh, during the 1920s because uh, the government actively, or the various governments, actively suppressed this monarchical movement. And they did this at the behest of, um, of uh, the uh, Austrian neighbors, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, uh, Hungary, uh, and so on, and in particular at the behest of the warmer, former war enemies, uh, France, Britain, and the US. All of them did not want to have uh, an Austrian monarchy, did not want to have the restoration of the House of Habsburg. Now, this suppression seized uh, under the authoritarian Dolfus government, uh, which came to power in 1933-34. And as soon as the suppression uh, ceased, well, there, there sprang into life a very active monarchical movement. Uh, its leader was, of course, the, the Dauphin, the, the, the prince, um, Otto von Habsburg, uh, who was, uh, uh, until the, the mid-1930s, so in the few years from 1933 to 1936, 1937, he had become an honorary uh, citizen of 1,540 uh, uh, approximately communal towns out of a total of 4,500 in, in Austria. So about one out of three Austrian towns had, had made him an honorary citizen. So that is a good indicator for the strength of uh, of this movement. Otto von Habsburg uh, had proposed that he take over the government in the, in the big crisis that led to the annexation of Austria in 1938, but uh, Schuschnigg did uh, not do this. Well, Otto was, was a young man also at the time, who was in his early 30s. And then he had to leave Europe. He also went to the US and also stayed in uh, New York City and uh, coordinated there. Uh, on the one hand, the, the cooperation of uh, various patriotic expatriates and also established diplomatic ties with the uh, US government and, and its war allies, uh, aiming at the preparation of Austrian independent, independence after the, the war. And he was very successful in these endeavors. So uh, first great success was uh, that in uh, late 1943, the uh, Western allies, well, including Russia, uh, agreed on the recognition of Austrian independence after the war. Uh, the, the U.S. established also an Austrian day, a feast day, and so on. Um, there were still conflicts among these expatriates, these uh, patriots, and these concerned, well, most notably the question of the form of state. And in particular, also of the scope of state. Form of state, should it be a monarchy or a republic? Uh, the monarchy, uh, should it uh, be based on popular consent or should it be based on uh, legitimacy grounds, hereditary rights? Um, there was a very strong legitimist faction within this, uh, within this group. Uh, one of its main representatives was a former colleague of, uh, of Mises, at the University of Vienna, Degenfeld was his name. And Mises, of course, uh, did not at all agree with this. Well, uh, we, we talked already about his theory of uh, uh, democracy, his economic theory of democracy. And for the crucial role that uh, Mises stressed uh, that, that democracy had was to pacify uh, the nation and it, it help prevent violent conflicts over the question which type of government we should have and uh, who should be in the government and so on. So when uh, Otto von Habsburg asked Mises uh, his opinion about, well, uh, the, the most suitable form of state uh, uh, that also should have after uh, World War II, and in particular about the possibility of reestablishing re re the monarchy, Mises said, well, okay, monarchy would be fine, but it would have to be based on popular consent. Right? Otherwise, we just enshrine uh, conflict uh, into the institution, uh, into the constitution from the very outset. Uh, 
But his biggest uh, disagreements uh, concerned not uh, with uh, Otto von Habsburg, who was is fairly a, a classical liberal, so he was a minimal uh, status, um, uh, but other members of the, these expatriate groups concerned the scope of the state. Many of them, well, well, wanted to run the country, didn't want to run it like the, the social democrats, or didn't want to run it like the Nazis, but they wanted to run it nevertheless. Okay. So a strong interventionist government and so on, and Mises saw no fruitful base uh, for cooperation here. Then he's, uh, some disgust, he, he said in the mid-1940s, well, the Austrians are like the French uh, Bourbons, right? the, the, the ruling house of France uh, until the early 1830s. Uh, they have learned nothing and forgotten nothing. So he uh, discontinued cooperation with uh, the Austrian National Committee uh, in late 1942 and 1943, and then fully turned toward uh, U.S. organizations. So he left all this European trouble behind and then sought integration into uh, American society. Um, Here we have then a, a transition. Uh, his contract uh, with uh, NBER, which was fu uh, funded by Rockefeller, ran out in, in 1944. So it was it extended two times, one time uh, after a year, and then another, uh, so in 1942, for another two years. Uh, Mises then even received uh, a two-year extension under the same conditions as before. It was the normal policy of the Rockefeller Foundation to subsidize the integration of European emigres, scholars, into American universities for about two years. Thus, Mises could be happy to obtain twice as much support. However, it was to be the very end of their cooperation. The second year's bonus was a not-so-subtle goodbye. The Rockefeller Foundation's uh, chief executive, ex executive made it clear, and the NBER executive with whom uh, Mises had to work made it even more stark, that this extension would be the last one. Fortunately for Mises, about uh, exactly the same time, he found a more amenable source of uh, support independent of the Rockefeller Foundation, namely the National Association of Manufacturers, NAM. The NAM leadership opposed the New Deal and other status projects. They were determined to prepare a counterattack, starting a large-scale campaign to educate the American public about the benefits of what they called the free enterprise system. NAM needed intellectual leadership from people who were conversant both in the world of business and in the world of ideas. By February 1943, they had discovered what they were looking for in the person of Ludwig von Mises. Many years in the Vienna Chamber of Commerce had accustomed him to dealing with businessmen and to communicating effectively his economic and political insights to this audience. Just when the Rockefeller Foundation made it clear that they were no longer interested in supporting him, NAM immediately stepped in and offered to hire Mises as a consultant, starting today. Mises became a member of the uh, Economic Policy Advisory Group. This was the name, Economic Ad Policy Advisory Group. He later also became a member of NAM's Economic Principles Commission and of its Advisory Group on International Economic Relations. The contract provided for an annual honorarium of $3,000. So more uh, than uh, his previous contract at N NBER. The contract was extended on an annual basis. In the 1944-45 period, Mises' honorarium increased to $3,600. He worked closely with NAM secretary Noel Sargent, who in 1943 commissioned a study from him on international monetary reconstruction after World War II. Now, this study, too, is, has recently been uh, published in uh, a volume edited by Richard Ebeling. By the fall of the year, Mises had written a 68-page memorandum on the subject in which he advocated a return to the gold standard 
and critical reconstruction plan and criticized reconstruction plans that Harry Dexter White and uh, John Maynard Keynes had made in preparation for the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference. A few months later, he took part in a NAM-sponsored expert meeting to discuss the Keynes and White proposals. By June 44, Mises had prepared another memorandum, this time on Monopoly. A few months later, he addressed two advisory committee luncheons on the West Coast. Now, that was uh, to be fateful. At that point, he had already acquired a solid reputation through the pu publication of two books, Omnipotent Government, English translation of the German manuscript that he had written about 1938-39. Uh, by the way, the German manuscript, the original, was published only many years later in the, in the, in the 70s. So it was a posthumous publication. Uh, so there was Omnipotent Government and another book, uh, Bureaucracy, uh, which presents an economic theory of uh, bureaucracy uh, that he had uh, just outlined in, uh, in socialism in a few passages and then in uh, on, uh, 10 or so pages in his critique of interventionism. So this he then turned into a full book. And uh, accordingly, so these were his first two American publications, and he was presented as, uh, quote, the most eminent and uncompromising defender of English liberty and the system of free enterprise which has reached its highest development here in the United States, unquote. Mises addressed the local NAM chapters in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So this was October 1944. And there he met, as he said, such excellent men as Leonard Reed, Orville Watts, and R.C. Hoyles. Now, these are three names that we, we should remember because they were very important allies for Mises uh, in the succeeding years. Not immediately thereafter, but then their, their cooperation would kick in with uh, full force in the 1950s. Leonard Reed, Orville Watts, was a Reed employee, and R.C. Hoyles, who was a, a publisher in Orange County. Uh, and he, uh, the, the newspaper that he ran is the, uh, was the predecessor of what is today. Is this the Orange County uh, Register? Is, is this the, the, the name of the paper today? Right. So that's, that's a Hoyle setup. Mises' encounter with Leonard Reed was a fateful one. They may have met a few years earlier, shortly after his uh, arrival in the United States. At any rate, uh, Reed later recalled such a first meeting in 1940. Maybe also that his memory escaped him, but okay, that's something that I could not tell from the records. Um, in any case, at this first meeting, he had been much impressed by the purity of Mises' opposition to any government power beyond the minimum necessary for the preservation of domestic peace and the market. Mises had reportedly attended a party in Reed's home. One of the guests asked him, quote, all of us agree with you that, there, that we are headed for troubled times, but Dr. Mises, let's assume that you were the dictator of these United States and could impose any changes you think appropriate. What would you do? Unquote. And, and uh, Reed clearly recalled the answer. He said, uh, quick as a flash, Mises replied, I would abdicate. <laughs> okay, so this made a, <laughs> this made a uh, very strong and positive impression on, on these West Coast men. And Leonard Reed eventually uh, moved in 1946, uh, 1945, he moved to, to the East Coast, moved to the New York area, and one year later set up uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, about which we'll talk a little bit later. Uh, so the, shortly thereafter, then Mises uh, became an American citizen. That was also one of the reasons why he did not uh, visit more with uh, his new friends in, in Mexico. He could not leave the country during uh, the application period. And he finally received citizenship in January 1946. Uh, at that uh, point, there were no plans to uh, return to Europe. But he finally got access again to his a pension fund from the former Chamber of Commerce in uh, in Vienna. So finally, with, with the new government, they started honoring again uh, the contract. 
only with a little problem that they had, of course, foreign exchange controls. So you could not export the money from the country. Right? So we are today so much blessed because we can just wire money from one country to another and bring money from one country to another. That was not possible. Right? So, and as a concept, that was the reason why Mises eventually came to spend a couple of vacations in Austria. I mean, what else do you do? Right? You, you go there and uh, uh, stay in nice hotels, and maybe you buy books and other marketable, highly marketable goods that have a high purchasing power per per, per weight unit. And that's all all you can do. Now. Uh, the intellectual situation in his uh, in his new country was of course bleak. Uh, Mises was very very well aware. Well, he was convinced at that at that point that um, uh, things were, from an economic point of view, of course, still better than in Europe. But from an intellectual point of view, uh, very similar. In fact, the American literature on economics was, if anything, worse than European one. Uh, this is what he wrote in a, in a letter to uh, a young Austrian economist, well, young economist in Austria, let's say, in, in those years, 1946. He said, there is a great enthusiasm in the US for unbalanced budgets, deficit spending, low interest rates, and all sorts of regimentation. Those who dare to disagree are simply brushed aside as orthodox and reactionary, unquote. Now again, this reminds us of something. And on the same theme, he continued uh, in another uh, letter, the intellectual ravages caused by Keynesianism are very bad. For example, everyone here is delighted the national income has increased from, from $77 billion in 1940 to 161 in 1945. Okay, of course, that's so unquote. That, that's, a, that's a nominal increase, right? <laughs> Simply because the, the money supply has been increased so much, so all prices increase, uh, does not mean that the nation has really become richer, right? Just because, uh, all, uh, because nominal spending has gone up. But the forces of resistance were slowly emerging. There was a seedbed of libertarian opposition. A network of leaders, thinkers, and organizers, some alone, others in small groups, who were preparing the counterattack. I've already mentioned the uh, NAM before. One historian has called these years the nadir of individualistic Jeffersonian thought in the United States. Yet the nadir was only in political practice. The thinking was no longer in disarray, but in the initial phase of a long-term resurgence. It is true that these thinkers and organizers were still scattered. They had only to find one another. There were journalists like Henry Hazlitt, Lawrence Fertig, Frank Chodorov, Susan LaFollette, Garrett Garrett, John T. Flynn, and John Chamberlain. By the way, we have in the library a couple of reprints of books by uh, John T. Flynn and Garrett Garrett uh, and others. There were writers like Albert J. Nock, also here, Isabel Peterson, Rose Wilder Lane, Ayn Rand, no, we don't have her here, and Felix Morley. There were organizers such as Leonard Reed, Frederick Neumeyer, and Lauren Miller. There were businessmen ready to sponsor educational ventures to promote laissez-faire policies, such as Jasper Crane, Harry Earhart, Alfred Kohlberg, Howard Pugh, Claude Robinson, Pierre Goodrich, and William Falker. And there were academics such as Benjamin Anderson, Davenport, Fred Fairchild, Leo Wallman, Frank Knight, Henry Simons, and Ludwig von Mises. These men and women reversed the course of events in a mere 15 years. They were not strong enough to rid America of its creeping statism, but they succeeded in slamming the brakes on the brakes and reorienting public debate. This is what's happening from 1945 to 1960. By the beginning of the 1960s, classical liberalism had risen from the ashes, and it had done so under the decisive impact and intellectual leadership of Mises. These 15 years of his life saw a last great blossoming of his creative powers, which paved the way for a new liberty in the Western world, 
During this period, Mises' impact was amplified and deepened through several new organizations that rallied a hitherto dis dis disparate and unaware public around the banner of liberty. And for the first time in his life, Mises worked with a group of students who had learned economic science through his writings. These first Misesians, we'll talk about them this afternoon more, became even more coherent and radical advocates of laissez-faire than the master himself. Something unprecedented for Mises. In his Vienna seminars, he had been in the awkward position of being more radical than his students. Uh, certainly for a professor, that's not a good thing. Now, the, the potential of the seedbed of uh, libertarian uh, networks broke to the fore for the first time in 1944 with the enormous success encountered by Hayek's Road to Serfdom. So Frederick August von Hayek published his famous book, his famous book The Road to Serfdom, uh, first in Britain and then in the United States. Uh, well, in Britain there was a reserved, uh, well, attentive but reserved reception. In the U.S. the reception was enthusiastic, it was a, was a, a nuclear bomb that that went on here. So Hayek uh, came to a trip uh, to the U.S., wanted to give uh, one talk, but then as sales uh, increased, and they, so tens of thousands of, uh, of copies, uh, he himself was very surprised in his publisher too because they had just had the, the English experience. And then he stayed on the, in the U.S. for months and, and gave one talk after another, one presentation after another. So what, what happened here was simply that you had these latent forces, these latent individuals and networks, and they they brushed forth uh, with this initial um, uh, incentive or initial e event of uh, of the publication of the Road of Serfdom. Um, uh, Mises was uh, enthusiastic and uh, well, very hopeful, very encouraged by uh, this reception. Although, of course, he did not fully agree with uh, Hayek's analysis, and uh, Hayek, as we have. Uh, said yesterday, uh, was part of um, uh, the, the emerging neoliberal movement, uh, was a central agent in this uh, neoliberal movement, and Hayek, uh, and in those days, he changed this, he, he became more radical in, uh, later in his life, in those days fully subscribed to the neoliberal agenda. So he subscribed to this division of, well, uh, market processes that should play themselves all freely within an institutional framework, whereas the institutional framework itself should be set up by, by the government. Um, so the government uh, should be planning for freedom, should be planning for free competition. Okay, so there was a positive role for, for planning. Positive, again, meaning the government should take care of it. Now, Mises uh, criticized it without, again, without uh, naming Hayek, but, uh, so without naming names, but he criticized the idea uh, in a paper with the title Planning for Freedom that he uh, presented uh, shortly thereafter, which then also became the title of a book, collection of essays that was first published in 1952, still available today, um, uh, in which he said, well, so the crucial question is who is doing the planning? Right? Of course, we always need planning, but the question is, who is doing the planning? Do we need the government to do the planning, or should private persons and associations do the planning? Okay. But again, this could not diminish his, uh, his joy and uh, uh, enthusiasm for the success encountered by Hayek's book. Um, uh, Mises then uh, uh, well, well, it, was integrated in this uh, libertarian seedbed, well, through uh, his association with NAM, which which stopped in 1946, but then especially through um, three individuals, respectively organizations, namely uh, New York University, uh, Leonard Reed, and Frederick Niemeyer, or Niemeyer. So I'll talk a little bit about these three uh, now. So, uh, starting in 1945, Mises uh, was uh, obtained a position as a visiting professor at New York University. So, he gave a class, in particular a seminar. Um, uh, the money was uh, essentially paid out of uh, private funds, 
a couple of friends who, who raised uh, money for him, especially uh, Lawrence Fertig and, and Hazlitt were involved. Um, and he never obtained a permanent position. So he was somewhat in the same position in which he had been at the University of Vienna. He was an extraordinary professor, in this case a visiting professor, and he would be visiting the University of uh, New York University for 24 years, and right? <laughs> 24 years in a row visiting them. Um, now the New York uh, University seminar was uh, the, the the central uh, vehicle, uh, the cradle, we might say, of the emerging Mises school. And this school emerged in particular after the publication of Human Action in 1949. Uh, so here we had then the training ground for. Uh, people who re received their economic formation through Mises himself, and in particular on the basis of his, uh, of his treatise on, on economics. Uh, all uh, the great uh, post-war uh, Austrians, virtually all of them, have come out of the seminar. Right? So we have Murray Rothbard, Hans Zenolz, Israel Kirzner, uh, George Riesman, Ralph Rako, uh, and so on. You have it, you, know, you name them. Um, so some of them are still fortunately with us. So for example, Ralph Reiko uh, will be teaching next week at the, at the summer university. Oh, by the way, since we are at it, right, we, are, we have in this room here two people who knew Mises, who have known Mises personally. It's, of course, not me because I was a, was a baby at the time. Uh, so we have Lou Rockwell, met him once or, or, or twice. And we have Richard Perry, who was a member of Mises' uh, seminar in the late 1960s, at the very end. And, and he was also the first person, as I learned only yesterday, who typed human action onto a computer file. Okay, so Richard, could you just raise your hand so that everybody can see? And so this is our one of our remaining links to Ludwig von Mises, remaining living links. Okay, then, so there was New York University, and then there was Leonard Reed, who Mises had encountered uh, during the war years, as, as, as we have seen. And Leonard Reed in 1945 comes uh, uh, to the U.S. and he first uh, uh, works for a libertarian uh, policy uh, organization, but which was not fully effective because they pursued the policy. Well, so they, they arranged debates and also publications, but in whatever debates they arranged, they, they pursued a policy of uh, uh, hearing every voice. Okay, so they would invite somebody defending an. A libertarian position, and then also to be equitable, invited a pro-government advocate. Now, Reed found that was completely pointless because the other side was being uh, being heard constantly, right? In all the journals, uh, the radio, uh, all publications, uh, the schools. Uh, the other side, that is the pro-government, the interventionist, the socialist position, was constantly explained, championed, uh, analyzed. So what was needed was an institution entirely dedicated to the, the explanation and, and defense of the libertarian position. And therefore, so he quit uh, this other organization and um, set up his own outfit, namely uh, the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, Reed could do so because he had uh, uh, an address book, at, uh, so we are talking about the time before the, the Internet, before telephone books even. Yeah, so he had a fully stuffed address book, excellent context to, to the business world because he had been for many years the chief executive of the largest chamber of commerce in the world, the chamber of commerce of, Los, of the Los Angeles area. Uh, and so he had the necessary uh, wherewithal and the necessary con connections. He set up this, this new institution and Mises was one of his main uh, intellectual allies. But Mises was not the number one uh, economist affiliated with Fee. He was one uh, among others. He turned into number one only, again, after the publication of Human Action in 1949. Uh, so Fee was not set up as uh, a cradle of the Austrian school. It turned into the cradle of the Austrian school. Or, uh, institution dedicated to the promotion of Austrian economics later on. Uh, the third uh, main vehicle for uh, the promotion of Mises' um, uh, impact on, uh, intellectual impact on, on America was Frederick Niemeyer, or Niemeyer. Uh, Niemeyer was a Chicago businessman 
uh, who in the early 1920s had worked at Harvard University, uh, setting up the Harvard Business Barometer. So he was acquainted with uh, methods of uh, business cycle analysis and so on. And uh, he was also a dedicated uh, uh, Christian uh, Calvinist. Uh, so, um, uh, putting out, uh, supporting uh, several publications, Calvinist publications, and so on. Now, he f uh, came across uh, Mises through uh, uh, the English edition, edition of his Theory of Money and Credit. Uh, and he was uh, very impressed by, by this book and started a correspondence with Mises and came then to uh, increasingly uh, to the conviction that, well, this was the way to go. The Austrian school, and Mises in particular, uh, are the most important intellectual uh, vehicle to the promotion of liberty in the Americas, and in particular, they are fully compatible uh, with Christian concerns, right? Christian morals and, and Christian theology. So uh, Neumeyer in the following years uh, arranged for and funded the translation of Böhm uh, Bavak's uh, Capital and Interest. Um, the work had already been translated. The first two volumes had been uh, so it's the first edition had been translated in the 1890s, uh, William Smart at the time. And, uh, but then the, the, the final edition, the third edition, um, had not yet been translated, in particular the third volume that Ben Bavak had created. So Neumeyer funded this and he, he got one of the translators from Mises, namely Hans Zenholz. Okay, and then he arranged for a co-translator, who was a native English speaker. Uh, Neumeyer also well, well, became a publisher of Mises. It was Neumeyer who published this uh, collection of articles that we already mentioned, Planning for Freedom, 1952. Uh, he uh, promoted, um, a, well, he, he printed uh, talks, uh, lectures that Mises had given to Mont Pelerin uh, society meetings and others, for example, uh, the lecture Profit and Loss, and was printed in several thousand copies and, uh, and other lectures as well. And he set up, his, finally, his own publishing house, Libertarian Press. Libertarian Press, which uh, still exists today, which uh, was eventually taken over by Hans Zenholz, and is today run by Hans Zenholz's son. So all this uh, emerged in, in those years. And I've already mentioned the uh, Mont Pelerin Society, so it's appropriate that we talk briefly about the, the MPS. Um, which uh, was an in initiative of uh, Frederick August von Hayek. Right? Uh, uh, during the war already, well, Hayek stayed in, uh, in Britain, did, did not go to the US, but he was already considering, well, he thought, well, I cannot just escape from, from Britain. I have to show my solidarity with the British colleagues and so on. So he stayed on the, on the spot. And there are quite funny letters that... that Hayek wrote from uh, from England. He said, "Well, I mean, look, I mean, these bombs and so on. It's not that dangerous. Finally, you get used to it. It's actually quite quite simple to extinguish a, a fire bomb and so on if you know how to do it." And yeah, it was quite relaxed. Um, so he stayed there, but then he was making plans for well, the preparation of uh, libertarian movement after World War II. And Hayek was well placed to do this because, well, uh, he was traveling a lot, and then especially his success uh, with the road of serfdom in the U.S. brought him in touch with virtually all libertarians all over the U.S. And of course, he knew his people in Europe. So Hayek was the man. He was the the, uh, the juncture of uh, the, uh, the intellectuals, intellectual pockets that in, in, uh, existed in those years uh, in Europe and the U.S. So uh, Hayek uh, prepared as a um, uh, as a first um, attempt to to integrate this uh, burgeoning movement uh, the arrangement of a conference the organization of a conference and uh, with the conference to establish a society of libertarian uh, intellectuals. It would not have to be, well, libertarian, but no, more precisely, neoliberal intellectuals. That is, the agenda that uh, emerged slowly in, uh, in the interwar period, in the 1930s in particular, should now be given a, a more permanent uh, form. In the 1930s, there had been already a conference of this sort. This was a Walter Lippmann colloquium that had been organized in 1938 uh, in, uh, in Paris. 
Mises took part in this too. But this was a one-time shot. Okay, people met there, it was predominantly Europeans, not many Americans. And so Hayek now sought to establish something more permanent, uh, society of intellectual, well, of neoliberal uh, scholars. Uh, and his main uh, source of funding was the William Folker Fund. Now that's important, especially for Mises. Of, one pattern in society is not that important for, for Mises, but uh, the, the Folker Fund is important for Mises. So the Folker Fund um, had been set up by, well, William Folker, V-O-L-K-E-R, uh, was a, a businessman from Kansas City of a German descent uh, who had um, uh, made, a, made a fortune in the U.S. and then finally married at some point in, in his 50s and, well, relaxed, laid back, and became a philanthrope. Okay, so he started funding all kinds of things, set up his own foundation. We also mentioned the, uh, the constraints of the income tax, right? so, which gave him an incentive to, to set up a foundation. So that's what he did, too. And he became the, his foundation became the main uh, source of funding for libertarian activities, libertarian uh, organizations in the immediate post-World War II period that is running from 1945 to 1960 approximately. So this coincided exactly with uh, the main impact that Mises would have uh, on the libertarian movement, a happy marriage. The Folker Fund was managed by a man with the name of Harold W. Luno, and later on by, by two brothers by the name of Herbert and Richard Cornuel, who were for some time also employees of Fee, Leonard Reed in, uh, in, um, in New York, and then moved uh, to, to the Folker Fund, which then relocated uh, after some years to California. Um, uh, and uh, precisely to that county of, of California, where we have today the uh, Center of Libertarian Studies. Uh, is this a pure coincidence? So Hayek, uh, with the uh, so how, how did the, uh, this uh, contact come about? Well, Hayek so he arranged for for this meeting, which was to uh, take place. The first meeting was to take place in, in Switzerland, uh, close to the Mont Pelerin, as a mountain in southern Switzerland, and therefore the society that came out of this meeting was also called the Mont Pelerin Society. Mises came into touch with the Forker Fund because, well, uh, well, he, somebody had to buy his plane ticket <laughs> and pay the hotel bills. Okay, so that was uh, the Forker Fund. Mises arranged this through them. Now, what about the meeting itself? Well, it became a neoliberal uh, meeting, right? But it's, it was a very interesting constellation. Um, in his opening address, uh, so we're talking about uh, spring 1947, Spring 1947. In his opening address, Hayek set the agenda for the post-war ideological reconstruction of the classical liberal movement. It involved, Hayek explained, on the one hand, purging traditional liberal theory of certain accidental accretions which have become attached to it in the course of time. Unquote. And on the other hand, quote, facing up to some real problems which an oversimplified liberalism has shirked or which have become apparent only since it has turned into a somewhat stationary and rigid creed, unquote. It's not quite clear to what he refers. As later developments would show, the concrete meaning of this program was first to exculpate classical liberalism from certain widely held criticisms, for example, that the policies it, in, it had inspired had led to mass misery. And second, to distinguish the modern liberalism or new or neoliberalism from its laissez-faire predecessor. Some of the other scheduled talks, however, were more neo and less liberal. For example, the German economist Walter Eucken explained that anti-monopoly legislation was not sufficient to combat monopolies. Further legislative inference was needed in the field of corporate law, patent law, and trademark law. He championed two maxims of economic policy. First, although there was to be freedom of contract, this freedom was not to be allowed to limit in any way the freedom of contract of others. Second, monopolistic market participants should be forced to behave as if they were in competition produce the same quantities and sell them at the same prices that would prevail under competition, by which he meant 
the model of perfect and uh, pure competition. In short, Eucken dished up the same interventionist agenda that had already dominated the Lippmann Colloquium in 1938. At that time, Mises had been on his honeymoon in Paris, which might explain why his contributions to the discussions had been unusually tame. Nine years later, 1947, the honeymoon was over. Mises reacted with great determination and defended his laissez-faire position so vigorously that many years later, uh, his friend Lawrence Fertig still recalled the debate. There was another source of uh, comment on this, this first meeting, namely Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman concurred with this observation. He said the following. Our sessions were marked by vigorous controversy over such issues as the role of religion and moral values in making possible and preserving a free society, the role of trade unions and the appropriateness of government action to affect the distribution of income. I particularly recall a discussion of this issue in the middle of which Ludwig von Mises stood up, announced to the assembly, you're all a bunch of socialists, and stomped out of the room an assembly that contained not a single person who by even the lowest standards could be called a socialist. Unquote. So quite vigorous debate. Friedman did not specify what he meant by the lowest standards. <laughs> In any case, while Mises was able to hold socialists in high esteem, if he believed in their honest uh, attitude, the incident showed that he had little patience with socialists parading as liberals. The exchange between Mises and his neoliberal opponents set the tone in the Mont Pelerin society for years to come. Willem Röpke would later pay a friendly tribute to Mises, even though the letter made as he said, sarcastic comments upon the unenlightened spirit of so many of its members, unquote, including himself. Although the libertarians around Mises were a small minority, it was they who had the financial backing of the main American sponsors, such as the Volcker Fund, without which the society would quick, quickly have died out in the early years. In fact, by, uh, by 1953, the Falker Fund was uh, paying the uh, membership fees uh, and even uh, uh, travel expenses of virtually all European members. Okay? Now imagine what this means. Well, it means that without the Falker Fund, there would have been no uh, MPS in the first 10 years or so. Uh, and this, of course, means that even though Mises and, well, his fellow uh, Manchesterists from, from New York, was essentially the New York faction was Mises, Fertig, Hazlitt, Reed, and others were the, the radicals. Well, even though they were a numerical minority, they had a very strong impact uh, on, the, on the agenda, on the discussions of the, of the society. Everybody knew, well, I mean, without these guys, we, we cannot go on. Society, society will quickly die out. Okay, so this was the situation in, uh, uh, until about 1947-48. This afternoon we'll talk about what happens with the uh, publication of Human Action in, in the succeeding years. We have now uh, some 13 minutes for questions. Did Mises ever give a reason that he didn't move down to Mexico City, or was it he just wasn't really interested? Uh, I, I didn't find any document in which he, in which he would explain in detail uh, why this is. At the beginning, it might have been that the material conditions, the financial conditions, were, were not uh, good enough. Uh, he later wrote to his, uh, his host, Montes de Oca, he said, well, because then he, he made a very attractive offer later in the 1940s. And Mises said, well, if I were 10 years younger, or I don't know, whatever, 50 or 20 years younger, I would accept it immediately. But uh, it's not clear to me whether he said this out of politeness or whether he genuinely uh, believed this. Um, yeah, I, I have no reason to believe that he lied, so certainly well. But he, he never ex explained in detail why he didn't do it the, uh, the first time. He, but he certainly considered it very, very seriously. But then things improved steadily also for him uh, in the U.S. And uh, one thing that was very important for him was, well, he didn't want to go to, the, to a province somewhere. He wanted to be... 
in um, uh, an intellectual center. Now, New York City was definitely, well, uh, the intellectual world center uh, in the post-war period, at least in the first 20 years or so. Uh, so before, uh, there were European competitors, and Vienna was one among them, Paris, Paris another. Uh, but uh, after the war, clearly, New York was a financial, uh, intellectual, cultural cultural center, so he felt uh, very much at ease. It was very similar to the life, well, different, of course, but similar in principle to the life he had led in uh, in Vienna. Right? So the big capital city, well, not political capital, but that was rather advantageous, but financial capital, cultural, intellectual. That's exactly how he found it in, in Vienna. Plus, there were, as I said, many of his friends, uh, wartime acquaintances were still there, so he could, in a way, build on what had already uh, existed. He was not completely deracinated. Uh, he got sometimes, uh, there was, was a talk of consideration, should he go to a, to a different university, but he, he, never, he never actively pursued this. Uh, so he wanted to stay there, even if he could have gotten maybe more money or more prestigious position somewhere else. Yep. Uh, who wanted to retranslate first of all from Babak? Was it Mrs. De Silvin or somebody else? Who wanted to retranslate Bern Babak's volumes? This this was a it was not Mises who brought this up. It was uh, Neumeyer. Neumeyer said, "Well, we need to have we need to translate all uh, of the major Austrian works into English. What's the best thing to start? What's the most important thing to?" To translate. And then Mises said, well, we would need to have a full translation of, uh, of Bim Bavak. Well, these previous volumes, that's smart translations. Well, because uh, this was the first edition. Bim Bavak had worked over, uh, it revised uh, uh, this first edition. So the, the third edition was the final, uh, it was a different edition. And plus, there was a third volume also. So this had to be translated anyway. Uh, but it's very revealing, right? I mean, music could have said, well, we have, uh, whatever, my important works from the 1920s, right, that need to be translated first, whatever, critique of interventionism or uh, liberalism and, and so on. But no, he did not say this. He said, well, we need to have uh, Bumbavak first. And he had a very, very high opinion about uh, the importance of Bumbavak's book. Why yeah. Why was who? who? Why is Ayn Rand not seen as popular here? No, I mean we, we don't don't just don't have uh, her book on say. I believe I'm not even sure about it. it. Might be that we have an Ayn Rand book, but I I, I didn't I didn't see it. Uh, Ayn Rand, uh, as far as now our subject is concerned, in the early days was not a main main figure. Ayn Rand really burst to the scene uh, after the, with the publication of uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged. Right. And then, of course, she became a main figure in the libertarian movement. And indeed was, was the only one who could rival the, the impact of uh, human action. Yep. I was wondering if Mises ever commented on the this early association between religion and sort of free market ideas in the early post-war American libertarian movement. No, he did not. I mean, there's, there's no uh, critical analysis of, of these connections and so on. Well, he respected these, these uh, religious beliefs. Um, he emphasized in, in, uh, uh, in two books that he, which, which crowned his uh, uh, reflections on epistemological problems, theory and history, ultimate foundation of economic science. So 1957, 1962. He talked a lot about uh, religion, so that's the, the play, uh, place to, to look for this. And uh, his position was that religion plays a very important role. It's also it's important for man because it gives us answers to questions that we cannot find anywhere else. His activity was, of course, science. Religion had nothing to do with science, so he believed. And um, but he very clearly saw the, the limits of science. And so you go, only can go so far, and what comes beyond this, well, I mean, you, you need religion, therefore you turn to prayer and so on. He did not at all disparage this. He was very respectful, and many of his uh, 
uh, promoters and also friends were, were, were Christians, very uh, convinced Christians. And we have, uh, for example, so we have Anaimaya here, but there were uh, among his uh, New York students in the 1950s, there were, were two that initially came from a, uh, a Christian uh, organization, Christian social analysis organization, namely um, George Cother, who had been here had been around until uh, until very recently. Josh Cotha was more, well, was almost 100 years old. He was 99 years old. And he died uh, last year or earlier this year. Uh, so I met him, still um, a very charming man. He has been around. So he came from this Christian uh, organization first. And also uh, Perry Greaves became a big-time Misesian in the 1960s and 1970s, a big promoter of uh, Austrian economics and Misesian economics in particular, the husband of Bettina Bean Greaves, who was still around, uh, he came from the same organization. So Mises attracted these people too. And uh, well, he, he, he liked their association. It was not because somebody was religious that he would uh, avoid contact. Yeah? Okay, no more questions. And we meet again this afternoon.